You happy to be in church tonight? <clears throat> Hallelujah. I always ask that. And I always expect the same <laughs> result. Now, praise the Lord. I just need to get my notes loaded here. Just excuse me a minute. Praise the Lord. You guys have a good, uh, good beginning of the week? I did. It was awesome. And yesterday was, was great because it was like 88 degrees for a while. And I was like, yes, yes. And then this morning I got up and it was like 30. And someone's like, okay, we live in the Midwest. That's what you, that's what you get. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to talk about revival tonight, if I can uh, get my notes here. Uh, I've kind of been stirred. Uh, do you guys know that we're living in the last days? And, um, and we have a job to do. Hallelujah. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know if, if you listen too much to this end time you know, teaching, then you're just like, well, it's like, well, it's so late. I might as well just give it up, you know, and just because uh, Jesus is going to come back next month anyhow. So what can I do? You know, but, uh, you know, Jesus said, occupy until I come. And we don't know how long that is. It actually might be longer than you think. But regardless, you know, just keep at it because, you know, we're going to keep on after, even after he comes. You know, it doesn't stop. We're going to live, do you know you're going to live forever? You know, and so, so we have a lot of stuff we're going to do. And, you know, we're going to start some things now. But uh, praise the Lord, we have an eternity to finish. Praise the Lord. So I was just looking at, <clears throat> at revival here. And uh, just, just the last, last couple of days, I've been a little bit more stirred about it. Uh, and here a while back, I was on, on actually on Billy Brim's website, I think, and I, I came across uh, a, a, a vision that Tommy Hicks had. Most of you probably don't know who he is. Maybe Pastor knows. But anyhow, he, um, he had a vision of the end time revival. And later on here, I'm going to read some of it to you because I want to bring out a few things. It's a long thing, so I just cut out a piece of it I think would, would pertain to us for right now. But he had, a, he had this vision in 1961. But uh, prior to this vision, uh, you know, talking about revival, he, he went to Argentina in 1954. Uh, he wasn't supposed to go, but, but uh, T.L. Osborne, he, he, he couldn't go. And so then the door opened for Tommy Hicks to go, and Tommy Hicks had been praying. And, and actually, like, like Paul, you know, he, he saw a man from Macedonia said, come over and help us. You know, and, and he, he, he had some kind of the same, same experience in prayer. It's like, you know, come down and, 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 and speak. I can't remember exactly what he said, but just come down and, and help us in Argentina. And so he did. And um, this, this, this um, revival, and it's a long story. I'm, I'm not going to go into all of it, but it lasted for 52 days. And it actually changed that nation. It shook the nation in 52 days. And... Um, I'm going to read some conditions prior to the revival just to show you, you know, what it, what it accomplished. And it says that Argentina was considered by mission boards to be the least fruitful mission field in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> so kind of a hard place. You know, throughout the entire nation of Argentina, the Assemblies of God, after 40 years of hard work, could only count for 174 adult church members by 1951. Wow. You talk about... Some, some, some <laughs> hard plowing, praise the Lord. And in 1949, a census of the three most successful denominations in Argentina totaled 574 members. Large churches at the time were made up of about seven members. That's not a whole lot of people. And spiritism was dominant in many cities and towns with churches being unable to get a foothold in those communities. The occult had a grip on millions, influencing every level of society. Christians frequented witch doctors for remedies to their sicknesses when they didn't have the money from modern medicine. And Roman Catholicism, being the official state religion, discriminated severely against Protestant churches. Protestants were often forbidden to use radio and television as well as to gain permission to conduct large evangelistic campaigns. So this was, was not a, a very fruitful place for the ministry, even after decades of people being there preaching the gospel. But in two months of 1954, three million people were reported to have attended this guy's meetings with 300,000 decisions for Christ. 
This is what they had recorded. And a massive number of outstanding healings. And so something must have changed. What do you think? You know, he came and then there was a flood, hallelujah, of the power of God. And, you know, and at the time I looked it up, the population in Argentina at that time was less than 18 uh, and a half million people. So when three million people come to the meetings, it's a major stir. You know, it was so much so that they talked about it in the major news outlets, and they talked about it where people worked, they talked about it everywhere. Because, you know, people had people they, they've known, you know, that, that threw away their crutches, got healed from terminal illnesses. I mean, God moved mightily. So, a lot of stuff changed. So this, this is a statement by the uh, Baptist missiologist. I don't know what he is, but a statistician, statistics person. <laughs> Named Arno Enns. He wrote that the Hicks campaign broke the back of the rigid Argentine resistance to the evangelical witness. And they saw also all these denominations come together, you know, and, and you saw many churches, and this move just continued. But, you know, it wasn't just Tommy Hicks doing this. I started reading a book here uh, called Thy God Reigns by a guy who was down there as a missionary, and, uh, and he told the story about a little bit what was preceding this revival. And, and to make a long story short before I start, you know, saying much more about what happened is that it was a bunch of hungry people. They were crying out to God in prayer for God to move in their nation. And, and he, he, he lists two different, I'm, I'm not even actually done with the book because I just bought it today. I was doing some research like, I need that book. So I bought it in Kindle so I could get my hands on it, you know, so I could start reading it. I was just amazed at what God can do when somebody gets on their knees and doesn't quit. There you go. Yep. Because this one guy I was talking about, he was, he was a, a missionary there. He was, he was sent there by, uh, 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 I don't know if it was Assemblies of God or whomever here in America, and he was sent down there by them to evangelize. And he had the same, same experience he was just, he was out there, he was handing out flyers, he was talking to people, he was talking to them about Jesus, and no converts. And it was just, just, just hard, hard uh, 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 work. I mean, when you, when you do what you do and you don't see any, any, any results, it kind of, you know, like this is getting old, man. You know, people are supposed to receive what I have. You know? <laughs> and so he... So he decided, you know, he was looking in the scriptures and, and he, he, he saw that, you know, the, the early church had some experiences that he didn't have and he couldn't see. And so he decided, you know, he says, if I'm, you know, he, 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 was, he was paid for by this missionary organization. So he said, you know, they, you, know you, you would work at least eight hours a day. So he said, I'm just going to devote myself to eight hours a day of praying and reading the scriptures. So he started doing that. And he said... One week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks went by, nothing. <laughs> he was praying and it seemed like nothing was happening. And he got to a place where he got really discouraged. He's like, well, you know, I'm going to set a timeline. You know, because God will surely, surely he will, he will know that if I set a timeline, I'm going to stop praying at this point, he's going to move. You know, she said, it's like by Friday at five o'clock, he said, if nothing happens by then, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. And guess what? Friday came, and 5 o'clock came, and nothing had happened. So he got ready to, to he said, if, if nothing happens, I'm just going to go back to doing what I used to do. He says, I'm going to get some tracks, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to hand them out, and I'm going to talk to people. But he said, he said, just as he was about to, to, to walk out, he says, one of them, because they, they had a church of a few, a few members there, and he said, um, one of the church members came with his unsaved son to his door, and stopped him, and so he started ministering to them, you know, and he, he said they sat there for hours, you know, and talking to him about the Lord and stuff like that, and he was about to, to, for them to leave, but then he said something to, you know, inspired by the Holy Ghost to this, this kid, and he just broke down and gave his life to the Lord. And so when they left, it had been hours, and it was too late to go out, and so, so the Lord spoke to him, and he said, see, he said, I can send them whenever I want to send them, you get back to prayer. And so he went back to prayer, and he started praying more and started praying, you know, and, and he kept on praying, and, and nothing really happened. 
And so, but then he had a, an impression and he said, the Lord, the Lord, well, actually the Lord told him, he said that um, you, you, you get together a prayer meeting for those that want to pray, you know, uh, for revival. And he said, you're going to have it, you know, from, from eight o'clock at night until midnight on this particular day. And he's like, Lord, I mean, I have a hard time getting people to pray on, on, at regular hours, you know, when they would, would come to church. He said, how is this going to happen? But he figured that, you know, if somebody's going to come, and he said, if they can't commit for the four hours, he said, ask them not to come. <laughs> this wasn't a seekers-friendly environment. And so, anyhow, and so he, so he, um, he got uh, three people to show up. Also, a backslidden preacher and his wife, and then one other person. That was it. And he said, so they started praying. And, uh, and at the end of the night, he said, said did anybody like get anything or, you know, uh, from the Lord. It's like, no. And then this one uh, lady of this backslidden preacher she said, well, she said, I felt like I was, you know, maybe I should just go to the table in the center of the room and just hit it. And, 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 and she said, but she was too timid to do it. And so she's like, nah, that's, that's probably just like, you know, just baloney anyhow. And so they, they, they just got to back, back together the next night, and they were going to pray again, and, and the same thing happened. The lady had this impression, but she was just like, no, she felt embarrassed at this point. You know, it's just like, well, I, I had still this urge, but I'm not going to do it, because that's just stupid. And so it's like, well, so they just dismissed, got back the next night, and uh, <laughs> he felt like this was from the Lord. So he encouraged her, but she was like, no, I'm not going to do it. So the end of the meeting, the fourth night they came together, he said, well, why don't we just sing some songs? And he said, and then he said, we're all going to go over to the table, and we're just going to hit the table. And so they, he went first, and then the other person, and, and, and then she went, and she, she, she hit the table, and when she did, the Holy Ghost fell. And he, she said that, that 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 third person that was there just raised her hands and started speaking in other tongues. She was instantly filled with the Holy Ghost. Her backslidden preacher, husband, got underneath the table, and he was speaking in tongues. And, 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 and she said, well, Lord, you know, I want it too. And so she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so from there on, there started this, this revival, you know, because God showed up. And a lot of times I think that, that, that we, we, we think that we can just do it our way or the convenient way or, and even if the Holy Ghost impresses us on, to, us, on us to do something, we do like she did, like, well, that's stupid. I'm not going to do that. Or even if it's something even, even more like, why don't you go and talk to them about Jesus? You know, a lot of times we, we hold back and we don't do it, so God can't move. But one thing that, that I, I could see here, and there was another story along the same lines. This was in a school where the Spirit of God just fell on the kids, and they started praying. So same, same kind of an ordeal, but there was, there was things that were prayed out so that God could move when, when, when Tommy Hicks came on the scene. You know, a lot of people think that, well, Tommy Hicks, you know, the great evangelist, you know, yes, he rose to kind of fame, you know, through this thing, but, but the foundation was laid by people that was hungry for a move of God. And the thing is that if we are not hungry, we're probably not going to see what we want to see. You know, and a lot of people are not even hungry. They're not even hungry for the move of God because a lot of times they don't even know what that is. But I believe, and I'm going to read some of this, um, this vision he had in 1961. You know, it's years later. And the reason why is that I want to stir your hearts because God has a great work he needs to do in these last days and he's going to have to do it through people. Right? And we can... And let me just read this, and then we're going to get into, and, and it's, it's going to be a little bit lengthy, and so just hang in there, all right? Um, this was on July the 25th of 1961. He was up in Canada. He said, I had hardly fallen asleep, and the vision and the revelation that God gave, me, gave to me came before me. The vision came three times exactly in detail the morning of July the 25th. I was so stirred and so moved by the revelation that this has changed my complete outlook upon the body of Christ and upon the last end time ministry. The greatest thing that the church of Jesus Christ that has ever been given to the church lies straight ahead, straight ahead of us. It is so hard to help men and women to realize and understand the thing that God is trying to give to his people in the end time. 
As the vision appeared to me after I was asleep, I suddenly found myself at the great high distance. Where I was, I do not know, but as I was looking down upon the earth, suddenly the whole earth came into view. Every nation, every kindred, every tongue came before my sight. From the east and from the west, from the north and the south, and I recognized every country and many cities that I had been in. And I was almost in fear and trembling as I beheld the sight before me. And at that moment, as the earth came into view, it began to lightning and thunder. As the lightning flashed over the face of the earth, my eyes went downwards. I was facing the north. Suddenly I beheld what looked like a giant. And as I stared and looked at it, I was almost bewildered by the sight. It was so gigantic and so great in stature. His feet seemed to reach to the north pole and his head to the south. Its arms were stretched from sea to sea. I could not even begin to understand whether this was a mountain or whether this be a giant. But as I watched, I suddenly beheld this great giant. I could see it was struggling for life, to even live. But his body was covered with debris from head to foot. And at times this great giant would move its body and act as though it would even rise up at times. And when it did, thousands of little creatures seemed to run away. Hideous looking creatures would run away from this giant. And when he would become calm, they would come back. All of a sudden this great giant lifted his hand towards the heavens. And then it lifted its other hand. And when it did, these great creatures by the thousand seemed to, fly, to flee away from this giant and go into darkness and into the night. Slowly, this great giant began to rise. And as he did, his head and hands went into the clouds. As he arose to his feet, he seemed to have cleansed himself from the debris and filth that was upon him. And he began to raise his hands into the heavens as though praising the Lord. And as he raised his hands, it was even unto the clouds. Suddenly, every cloud became silver, the most beautiful silver that I've ever known. As I watched this phenomenon, it was so great, I could not even begin to understand what it all meant. I was so stirred as I watched it and cried unto the Lord and said, Oh Lord, what's the meaning of this? And it felt as if I was actually in the spirit and I could feel the presence of the Lord even as I was asleep. And from the clouds, suddenly there came great drops of li liquid light raining down upon the mighty giant. And slowly, slowly, this giant began to melt, began to sink, as it were, into the very earth itself. And as he melted, his whole form seemed to have melted upon the face of the earth. And this great rain became to, became, began to come down. Liquid drops of light, as it were, began to flood the very earth itself. And as I watched this giant that seemed to melt, suddenly it became millions of people over the face of the earth. As I beheld the sight before me, people stood up all over the world. They were lifting their hands and they were praising the Lord. At that very moment, there came a great thunder that seemed to roar from the heavens. I turned my eyes towards the heavens and suddenly I saw a figuring, figure in white, glistening white. The most glorious thing I've ever seen in all my life. I did not see the face, but somehow I knew it was the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he stretched forth his hand, as he did, he would stretch forth his hand upon the peoples and the nations of the world, men and women. And as he pointed towards them, this liquid light seemed to flow from his hand into this person. And a mighty anointing of God came upon them. And those people began to go forth in the name of the Lord. I do not know how long I watched. It seemed it went into days and weeks and months. And I beheld Christ as he continued to stretch forth his hand, but there was a tragedy. There were many people as he stretched forth his hand that refused the anointing of God and the call of God. I saw men and women that I knew, people that I felt that certainly they would receive the call of God. But as he stretched forth his hand towards this one and towards that one, they simply bowed their heads and began to back away. And to each of those who seemed to bow down and back away, they seemed to go into darkness. Blackness seemed to swallow them everywhere. I was bewildered as I watched it. But these people that he anointed, hundreds of thousands of people all over the world, in Africa, Asia, Russia, China, America, all over the world, the anointing of God was upon these people as they went forth in the name of the Lord. I saw these men and women as they went forth. They were ditch diggers. They were washerwomen. They were rich men, poor men. I saw people who were bound to paralysis and sickness and blindness and deafness. As the Lord stretched forth his hand to give them the anointing, they became well, they became healed, and they went forth. And this is the miracle of it. This is the glorious miracle of it. Those people would stretch forth their hand exactly as the Lord did. And it seemed that there was the same liquid fire that seemed to be in their hand. As they stretched forth their hand, they say, according to my word, be thou made whole. As these people continued in this mighty end ministry, I did not fully realize what it was. And I looked to the Lord and said, what is the meaning of this? And he said, this is that that I will do in the last days. 
I will restore all that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar. I will restore all that they have destroyed. This, my people in the end time, shall go forth as a mighty army that will sweep over the face of the earth. Now, that was a lot to read. But the giant is the church, as you probably realized from this, from what he's saying. And the, the church has been sleeping. The church has been sleeping and it's been covered in debris and not moving. Even though we have the power of God residing in us. And as I was reading this, I'm realizing that, man, you know, God is going to do what he's going to do through the church. But it's the church that is waking up to who they are in Christ, to what Jesus has done for them, to who he is in them. You know, Jesus is real. Jesus is alive. Jesus, is, his spirit lives in you. And if he's going to do what we all know he's going to do in the end times, it's going to have to be done through the church. Jesus himself, he is in heaven. We are the body. We are in the earth. And I was just thinking back here to 2019 when we were in Samoa. It's interesting because what, what Patty Dunnick was teaching her, her church there was who you are in Christ. She asked me to speak on the Sunday morning. She said, speak on whatever you want. I didn't know that she'd done that until after, but I felt impressed to speak on who you are in Christ. Why? Because if you don't know who you are, you're not going to do the works of Christ. If you don't know, if you're not settled in the fact that, you know what, the Spirit of God is with me. And when you, if, you're not, if you're not settled in the fact that actually when I lay my hands on the sick, they will recover, you won't do it. Praise the Lord. I've been reading the book of Philippians again and again and again. Because I don't know why, I just felt impressed to read it. And there are some things that are really, really sticking out to me. You know, sometimes you have to read stuff more than once. Have you ever noticed that? You know, I know you have the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know. And so you read some of the same stories, but from a, from a different perspective. But even just reading the same book and asking God, well, God, what do you want me to get out of this? You know, because sometimes we take a scripture and, 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 and don't read the context. So I started reading the whole, the whole book. You know, every time I read, I just read, you know, all, all, all of the four, four chapters of Philippians. But in Philippians chapter 3 is something I kind of want to bring out today. And Paul has just listed off in the beginning of chapter 3, you know, that, that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, you know, and all this stuff that would, would, would really, you know, be of benefit to him naturally. But he, in verse 7 is where I'm going to start reading here. He says, what things were gained to me, these are counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. But I then I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was going after it. You know, I've been, I've been, I've been looking at this and, you know, he says, he says in, in verse, is it in verse 10? Uh, no, it is, uh, no, in verse... 12, he says that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. There's a purpose for which God laid hold of you. There's a reason why he reached out to you. Do you know that? There's a reason why God called you. And that's what you need to lay a hold of and pursue and fulfill. 
Work on your own salvation with fear and trembling, Paul says. You know, what does that mean? Well, it means that we need to go after it. We need to go after what God has called us to do. Because if you don't go after it, you're never going to do it. There needs to be a hunger in you for the things of God. The things of God can no longer just be fit into your schedule when it fits everything else you're doing. Those days are over. Those days are over. You cannot afford to do that. There is a high calling of God upon your life that you need to fulfill. You, I, I know at the end of my life, I am going to stand in front of God and give an account for his call upon my life. I'm going to give an account for the anointing that he gave me to preach the gospel. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I showed you? I'm going to give an account. And so are all of us. We're not going to be able to hide behind somebody else. Your husband or your wife, it's not going to happen. Because when you're in front of God, it's you, my friend. But the good news is that you're more than able to do what God has called you to do. You know, there's a reason why, you know, we, we, we keep talking about who you are in Christ. There's a reason why Paul was praying the Ephesians prayer for the Ephesians. As soon as he realized these people are genuinely born again, he said, I started praying for you. And I'm going to read that, that prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. I know you've heard it before, and I know you need to hear it again. Praise the Lord. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You know, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus, who he is. There's a reason why Paul prayed like this. Because when you understand, when he starts to reveal himself to you, you will find yourself in there. When you, st when you start to see who he is, when you start to see how amazing Jesus is, his love for you, then you will start finding yourself in there because you've been placed in his body. So it's, in, and, and I know that he wants to reveal it to you. That's why he impressed on Paul to pray this. Let's keep, pick it up here in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We need light. We need understanding. The only one who can give you understanding of God is God. You know, you can't figure him out in your natural head. Everything that you learn about God, he reveals to you. God cannot figure God out. God reveals himself to man. And to who does he reveal himself? To those that seek him. Those that thirst and hunger for righteousness shall be filled. If you will seek his face, he will reveal himself to you. As I was reading, you know, about this, these, these, these people... You know, back in the, in, the, in the late 40s, you know, praying, you know, just, just, just wanting God in their lives and, 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 and wanting the reality of, of, of his power in their lives. You know, you know when I was reading, this guy, was, he, was, he was born again and he was filled with the Spirit. But still, he didn't see anything, you know, moving in his life. Well, there's a lack of light. There's a lack of understanding. But he was hungry. He was hungry and he didn't give up. You are in a little bit different place you have a lot of knowledge. There's been a lot of preaching. I think America is probably the, the most taught nation on the planet. You have no idea how blessed you are, how blessed I am to be here. I mean, I, I've been in other nations coming from Norway, dude. There is a lack of light. There's a lack of teaching. But it has gone forth here in America. But somewhere along the line, we've kind of gotten... Maybe too comfortable, I don't know. 
maybe too comfortable so we didn't have to seek God as much as we once did. And the thing is that if you don't, if, you, if, if he's not at the top, then you're going to have some issues because God is number one, whether you put him there or not. And he's not going to share his place with anybody else. If you don't honor his things, guess what? You get nothing. If you don't honor God, if you don't put him first, there will be no revelation in your life. I'm telling you right now, you need to put him first. You need to put God and his things first. If you don't, then you're going to continue to walk in semi-darkness and you're not going to be dissatisfied because there, your heart knows there's more. You might be okay in the natural. You might, your needs might be met, but there's something in you that is not satisfied. And it will not be satisfied until you're in the middle of the will of God for your life. I've been there. I went to Bible school when I was 18 years old. I walked away from the Lord. I had a good income. I was working offshore. I had a good income, but there was something missing. And finally it got to me. You need to get back to where you're supposed to be. Did you know that the grace of God on your life can work in a measure to make you a success wherever you go? But a lot of times that's not what it was meant for. Only God can fill the void. And if you are unsatisfied, the only way to get that fixed is on your knees. It's on your knees in his presence. Dude, I was just sharing on, on Sunday morning with, uh, with uh, the class we're talking about healing. And I was just, just sharing a little bit about, you know, how God moved in our little town there on the, on the coast of Norway. You know, my mom, she was, she was saved as a young person because I, I, I called her. I said, well, I, I told your story. And, and, and it's like, can you tell me again? Because I'm sure I, I missed a lot of it. But anyway, <laughs> so she told me, you know, she was, she was saved at a young age, but she kind of walked away. Now she had two kids. This was in the uh, 1982, I think. I was seven. My, my sister was five. And, and she was, she, this, this fear came. She was afraid to die. Just a horrible fear of dying. And I remember seeing a, a picture. We went on vacation down to Cyprus, next door to Lebanon, down there in the Mediterranean. And, uh, and she was skinny as a rail. She couldn't eat. There was so much fear. And so she, she uh, <laughs> finally repented. Say it with me. Repentance. It's a good thing. So she repented. And she said, Lord, I don't want this. I want you. And you know what? He took away the fear. Just like that. You know, the thing is, a lot of times what is bothering people is because they're outside of where they're supposed to be. You know, and it's, it's God. He loves you. You know, he loves you. If he's trying to work on your heart, it's just get you back into the blessed place. You know, he knows what is in you. He knows what you're called to do. We're all called to walk in the blessing, in a place of joy and peace, where we are fulfilling divine destiny. And so she, but I was just thinking about that. And after that, you know, she... She, she started, you know, hauling us around to all these meetings because she was like, she just wanted God and whatever God had. And I can remember being, you know, drug around to all these meetings and all these, all the ladies loved my cheeks. You know, they would come over and squeeze my cheeks. And I was like, get away from me. You know, but, <laughs> but what I do remember, some of these, these, you know, tent meetings, they would have tent meetings, you know, out in the field. I almost can still smell the grass, you know, and all that. But the power of God would be present. And I remember I was, you know, eight years old at this time, and I, I remember just running to the altar, just running to God. You know, I didn't know any better, so I would just repent every time, you know. I, I ran to the front, and I was just getting saved, you know, over and over again, but... 
But the point is, I was yielded to the Spirit of God, and I just wanted God. And if we could get back to that, God would be able to bless us in a great measure. You know, Jesus, you know, you have to become like one of these. What does that mean? It means somebody who hungers for God, somebody who wants God more than anything else. It'll bless you. Because the thing is that when you seek him, he will meet you. If you're 8 years old or you're 80 years old, it doesn't matter. God is the same. He treats everybody the same if you will come to him with a whole heart. And the thing is, you know, we, we, we do teach about who you are in Christ. But the only place that you can really get a revelation of who you are and who he is, is on your knees. He's on your knees in his presence. He will meet you there. If you value the things of God as you should, you should do that. <laughs> and the thing is, the more that you see, the more you fall in love with him all over again. Because the thing is that when you get in his presence, he just reveals his goodness and his mercy and how much he loves you. Because he's not out to find fault. He's out to help you. He will reveal, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the Holy Spirit, he will reveal what the blood of Jesus has done. He will reveal how good God has been to you. He will reveal to you what it means to be free from the bondage of sin. Because you are free. You're completely free right now. Sometimes we need to shake it off. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, he's a good God. And he wants to do some exceptional things through us, this church. You know, the thing is that God doesn't change his mind. Linda, could you go up and play? I just like having her play in the background. You know, God doesn't change his mind. You know, even when I, I got off track for, what was it, 16 years or something? That's a good chunk of time, right? But God doesn't change his mind. His gifts and his callings are without repentance. I was praying to, tonight in here before service, and I was just asking the Lord, Lord, just bring back to their remembrance the things that you've already talked to them about. Because there's no child of God that hasn't heard from heaven. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes it becomes distant. So I asked him, Father, in your great mercy, I ask that you would just bring it back up to the surface. Show them that your gifts and your callings are without repentance. You never change your mind. And you know, there's still time. There's still time. <laughs> there's still time. To do all that God has called you to do. There are people out there hurting. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. You might think, you, you think too little of yourself. When I read about the people that God have used mightily, it's just because they made themselves available. He can do the rest. What he struggles with is to get your cooperation and your obedience. To really just lay down your life and say, Father, you bought me with a great price. I am yours and I will follow you. Because if you'll do that, he'll meet you. 
and he will start to train you in the paths of righteousness. He will lift you up to a place that you never thought you could attain to. Because he has a great plan for your life. A great plan. It's greater than what you could ever comprehend in your brain. It has to be revealed to you by his spirit. Is that great? God doesn't make any small plans. He's a big God. He's a big God. <laughs> oh, he's a big God. And when you know that he's on your side, when you know that his spirit actually lives in you, there's nothing you can't do. Nothing you can't do. So I just want us to close our eyes for a second here. And Father, we've heard from you tonight. And Father, we love you so very much. And we ask you, Father, to help us. To reveal to us, Father God, your great love. Hallelujah. How much you love us, Father. And to bring back to our remembrance, Father, those things that you told us in the past. And maybe we disregarded them because we thought it's not possible. I can't do that. But Father, bring it back up. Hallelujah. Because with your grace and with your anointing, we can. Help us, Father God, to stop looking at ourselves and to look at you. So that we, Father, see ourselves in you rather than trying to get to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for, for the grace and for your anointing upon this church. Because your, ah ha ha, your plans don't change. Ondros tikaba lindres to koto rabata la lindre. Utruba rendes tikito rabata la lindre des to koto brasta kede. Your plans, they do not change. The anointings that have been given, hallelujah, for the job are there. Hallelujah. And your plans and your purposes are still the same. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father God. For the grace that is available, Father, for this body of believers to do your will and accomplish your purposes. I see this place, Father, packed with people that need help, that need deliverance that need to be set free. And they will be set free, Father. And your glory will be manifest in this house. There's been many words, Father, prophetic words over this place. And Father, you have not changed your mind. No, no. And I thank you, Father. Hallelujah. That you waken up the giants. You're helping each and every one of us, Father, to find our place. Hallelujah. So we can walk, Father, in your glory and in your anointing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hmm. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Father, for working on hearts in this place and in those watching online, Father. Stirring the call. Hallelujah. Can you sing that song, Linda? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just join her. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If this has stirred your heart, raise your hand. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. You see, Father, these hands. I ask, Father, Kindrostu Kabra Elendri Deshtri. Oh, hallelujah. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Kentor Dishta Kalandro Dostu Kodobara Bandar Elendri De. Hallelujah. I want you to just come to the front, the ones that raised their hands. I want to lay hands on you. Hallelujah. Just keep on singing in the background, Linda. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.